Hey there, Susie here. Before we get into today's episode, I want to share this special message with you. Now, my co-host Michelle and I love masterminds. Not only do we belong to masterminds, but we also host a mastermind. We started it almost eight years ago, and it is the premier mastermind for women business owners who want to grow their business with a specific focus on marketing. Now, this group is usually completely booked out, and very occasionally we open the doors and invite a handful of women in. So if you're growing your business, but you're struggling with feeling overwhelmed, or like you constantly have a split focus when it comes to your marketing, this could be exactly what you're looking for. We have an amazing time together and the women in the group are extraordinary. They're great cheerleaders, supporters, advisors and colleagues for you. And they're also seeing extraordinary results. We see people cracking the million dollar, two million dollar, three million dollar mark, launching new e-commerce sites that go from zero to ten thousand dollars a month in sales. They're doubling their conversion rates, they're growing memberships, they're selling courses, they're growing their personal brands, and they're getting all kinds of media exposure and speaking opportunities and so much more. You can learn more about the Mastermind and join the wait list over at herbusinessmastermind.com. We're going to open the doors soon, so you definitely want to be on the list to get an invitation. So head on over to herbusinessmastermind.com. Create content that attracts, converts, and keeps your ideal clients. This is Content Cells. Hi and welcome. You're listening to the Content Cells podcast. This show is all about how to create content to attract, convert, and keep your ideal client. I'm Susie Daphnis. Welcome to this very first episode. We're referring to it as episode zero because we want to give you an overview here of what's to come. It's about how to ensure that all the work that you're doing to create content and all the work you're thinking about doing ties right back to your business purpose and brings you real results. In each episode, we're going to be giving you specific strategies that we'll show you how to implement so that the content you create, whether it's pages on your website, what you do on social media, what you say when you're asked to give a presentation, and what you say anytime you have a chance to interact with your audience on any platform, online and offline, is really working for you. My co-host is Michelle Falzon of We Are Content. Hey, Michelle. Hey, Susie. How are you going? I'm doing great. I'm really excited uh, to be launching this podcast. Yes, me too. I mean, we've been talking about it for a while, so it's wonderful to see it uh, come into reality. Uh, I know so many people, uh, you know, are putting a lot of time and energy into their content marketing and not actually getting anywhere. So I'm keen to uh, share with them what we've been doing that's getting results and what other experts are doing uh, to get some traction with their content marketing. Great. And so if you're new to me and Michelle, um, then you're going to get to know us really, really well. Uh, Now, like Michelle, I've been in marketing for a very long time. In fact, one of my very first roles was as a marketing assistant to the head of marketing at Virgin Retail. And I spent most of my early years as a direct marketer, mostly doing newsletters, marketing letters that would be sent in the post and creating flyers and billboards and radio ads, all sorts of things to promote the different companies I either worked for on my own or business. But when the internet came along and it's been around for a long time now. Um, But, you know, we were very quick to get into online marketing and website marketing and using email as part of our communication. But then things took a turn again. And more recently, we've been creating podcasts and webinars and online courses and online mentoring programs, blog posts, articles, ebooks, white papers. You know what I mean? We do a lot of content marketing and People often ask me, how does a small team like ours create so much content? So we had a goal to start producing really good content and to be really consistent in the creation of that content. And we achieved that. But what we didn't always have was a strategy about how to produce content that actually converts to sales. So we were creating really good content and it was working to create goodwill and provide information and really build our authority in our niche and our marketplace. And we were hoping that by putting out really great work, we'd get sales. And we got sales, but the amount of work that we were putting into creating content didn't stack up to the conversions we were getting. And there were a couple of reasons for this. And Michelle and I will talk about that um, today as we introduce you to what we're going to be covering in this podcast. Michelle, is there anything you want to add just before I move on? 
No, only to say that um, really I don't think you're alone in that. I think this is a big dilemma a lot of companies are facing. They're really putting so much into their content and it's just not equating in terms of a return on investment in terms of sales and conversions. And it doesn't have to be that way. That's the really great part. And I'm glad that you say that it doesn't have to be that way. And it was only when we made this big shift um, that things started to click in in a different way. And the reason we made the shift is that something big has changed over the last few years in marketing. And I'm sure those listening, um, you've noticed that these changes have had a really big impact on our business and possibly on yours and just generally in the way business is done. And that is that the way that our customers are buying from us has changed, especially over the last five years. And anyone who doesn't understand that this shift is happening and has happened is really going to find their leads and sales dwindling. And it's going to only get harder and harder to meet sales targets and stay profitable. We really believe that by understanding how to use content, you can really turn your leads into business. And I want to talk about leads very, very quickly because um, as an educator, as an organization, and just for our own business, a lot of the emphasis has been on creating new leads. And that includes, you know, creating lead magnets like eBooks and reports and checklists and infographics and quizzes and doing lots and lots of social media, blog posts, as I mentioned before. And while creating this type of content will give you somewhat of an unfair advantage over your competitors. It's just not enough. It's not enough to create content, even if it's exceptional content. And it's not enough to create it just to create new leads. We want to create content because it's going to create leads that sell and it's going to sell ultimately. Um, Because otherwise, we can find ourselves spinning our wheels a little bit, right? Absolutely. And I think we've got to the point now where people have, you know, been hearing about content marketing for a few years. Podcasting is really on the rise. Um, Blogging, of course, is very well established. Um, Social media, of course, has got everyone's attention. And so it's been around long enough and there's been a significant amount of buzz that most people in most businesses are doing some form of content marketing. Um, But the problem is most people are doing it just plain old wrong. Um, They're driving themselves into the ground, creating content. Like you said, you know, lead magnets, blog posts, podcasts. There seems to be another bright, shiny object or another bright content marketing strategy every five minutes that we sort of feel we've got to bust a gut to get done. And uh, what that can often do is generate a lot of leads. But what happens then is that those leads, if you're not really nurturing those leads and working strategically with those leads, can go cold very, very fast and really not turn into the promise that they originally sort of or the potential, fulfill the potential that they originally had. So if people listening right now are saying, yeah, that's me, I'm writing, you know, blog posts till they're coming out of my ears, I'm I'm tweeting, I'm putting stuff on on Facebook, I'm, you know, active on LinkedIn, but I'm not getting any closer to my goals, then this is really a podcast for you because um, this is really about creating content that sells, content that meets an objective rather than just being a time and an energy suck like it can be for many businesses right now. And Susie, you were saying, you know, you kind of were putting out a lot of great content and just sort of thinking, you know, if we put out great content, then that will just come back to us in sales. And it was perhaps a little more of a general strategy than a specific strategy. And something that I like to say and that I know that you and I have uh, a phrase that we really love as well is this golden concept and it's the foundation of all the work that I do and it's this, no content without conversion. So that, that concept will really help you to focus in your content marketing and I'll just say that again, no content without conversion. And, you know, sometimes, as you know, Susie, I can get misconstrued with this statement. People Mm. think I'm going in for the hard sale on everything, you know. Every time I I tweet something or I put out an email or I do a webinar, it's all about the hard sale. And that's, that's actually not what I mean at all. I guess what I'm talking about is that every piece of content has a specific job. Every piece of content has a conversion activity inside of it. Now, that doesn't always mean that it's a shopping cart click. (laughs) You know, um, it just means that each piece of content is designed for a specific who, a specific ideal audience, and it's strategically placed within a larger process to move that ideal audience towards a specific what. And in the case of our leads and our clients, then that's ultimately moving somebody towards a sale. 
So to explain that a little bit more, for example, the job of an email subject line, if we're looking at that through the, through the no content without conversion sort of lens, then the job of that email subject line, the conversion activity, is to get the open. And then once somebody opens our email, then the job of the content that makes up the email body copy, the job there, the conversion activity there is to get the click. And then once somebody's clicked on our email and come to our landing page, then the content on that page also has a conversion job to do. And that's to get the opt-in. That's the conversion activity there. So, you know, like we said, many people just figure if I create great content and build a tribe, people will find a way to buy from me. And whilst that can be true, people reading your blog may fish around on your site to find your upcoming event or your online store. In my experience, you'll get much better and much more reliable results if you build a much more strategic content framework that doesn't make it so hard for people to buy from you and really helps people to to join the dots. Could I jump in there very quickly to say that I'm surprised how hard I can make it for my customer (laughs) without (laughs) intending to, but just the way that the content is positioned or what's either adding too much or omitting things that are really important that create that pathway for the customer to convert to a lead or to, you know, click that button or to open. And for me, you know, this podcast is about being really thoughtful with every aspect of what we're doing for content. That, that's it exactly. And the really sad thing is that I look at people all the time doing producing really fantastic content and, in fact, the shift to this idea of no content without conversion, it, there can be, you know, a fair amount of work involved if you're going to build a funnel and all those things behind it. But even at its simplest level, you can implement some things straight away that are going to move the dial for you in terms of the results you're getting from your content. And so I couldn't agree with you more. It's really about creating content that's still really valuable, that's not about it being salesy or overtly click here, press hard. It's it's about doing all the great work that we do and also realising that that content then sells. Because like you said, you know, making it hard for our our, uh, our clients to buy from us is very, very typical. And usually if a person arrives on a page and they don't know what to do next, what they will do next is just leave. Mm. So without giving them those pathways, without making your content part of a strategic framework, you're really sort of seeing ideal clients come in, love what you do, and then go, huh, okay, and then walk back out. So we want to help you create content that sells, and that's why we've called this podcast Content Sells. It's all about how you can create content that appeals to your ideal client and brings them into your into your universe and enables you to nurture them, inform them, educate them, all those things that you really love to do and that is the essence of content marketing. And then when they're in a position that they're ready to buy, you've also put the framework in place that you are their first port of call and that you've put yourself into a great position to get that sale. So it's really uh, a fusion of of direct marketing and content marketing, I think. Um, and Susie, you were saying, you know, that you you started early on uh, in direct marketing, uh, as have I. And I think that really brings, um, I think there's an advantage to having come from that sort of a yeah. background. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, um, direct marketing is historically great at asking for the sale, but it was often quite low on content. It was all about sort of, you know, clever copywriting or, you know, creating scarcity or deadlines or bonuses and all those things that sort of encourage that direct action. Whereas content marketing is, it came along and it was great at providing useful content for people. But what I think people missed in that was that they were often not great at asking for the sale. And so what I think we're looking at here really is a smooshing together, and that's a technical term, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's this smooshing together of direct marketing and content marketing. And, um, you know, like you, Susie, we've been doing marketing for a long time, 25 years doing this, and, and I've really done both. I've been on both sides of that equation, creating a lot of content even in the early days, um, films and videos and radio production, white papers, all that sort of thing, courses, events, a lot of content and also then doing the direct marketing, email marketing and direct mail, etc. And so 
it's this applying thinking from both of these worlds to create content that gets you sales is kind of what we're all about here. It's content that's going to grow your database, encourage repeat purchases and build that tribe of raving fans who also like to buy from you because I think it's easy to build a tribe of raving fans who kind of never, ever move beyond that phase of just loving you. (laughs) Yeah, and it's all well and good to have lots of fans and lots of people on your database but how do you move them towards helping you achieve some of your business goals, which I have no doubt will incru- include getting some sales? <laughs> so I, I love that no content without conversion, and I've really taken it on board. And um, and I love how you explain that it doesn't always mean a sale, but it's about someone taking that next step. And one of the things that I think will really help Michelle is for people to understand the buyer's journey. And I hinted that things have changed, and I'll explain a little more about what I found out about that in just a moment. It really goes back to this buyer's journey. And so, Michelle, I was wondering if you could give us an overview of the way that buyers do move towards a sale. Sure. And look, this isn't um, necessarily, uh, you know, a framework that I've developed. It's a framework that over, you know, many years and many, you know, strategic marketers thinking about this and plotting this process has kind of become an acceptable process. or a widely accepted understanding of the way a person moves from not knowing anything about us to buying from us. And so if you can think of it like, um, I like to think of it like a triangle and at the bottom of the triangle is this first level which is awareness. And people at first are not aware of us. So if we're selling a particular product, they may not know us from a hill of beans. And they may not even be aware that they need our product or service. Even though if we gave them an opportunity, if we gave them some education or we explained to them why this product or service was so vital, they may become aware that they need it. So initially our ideal client is in a state of blissful ignorance about us and potentially even about the product or service that we offer. And so something happens to bring them into a state of awareness. They see our ad, they read our blog, a friend tells them about it, whatever it is, we start to come into their field of awareness. After a period of time, some people will make the next step up. And so if you can imagine the triangle now, there's another level above that called consideration. Some people will become aware of us and never really want to do anything with us. They don't ever move into this consideration phase. But some people will become aware of us and think, oh, I wonder if I should be doing something about that. And I wonder if these people are the right people. I'm going to go out and sort of do a bit of investigation and see, you know, who's a good travel agent or, um, you know, what sort of car I should buy or, um, you know, where's the best restaurant to go on Friday night. So they move into this level of consideration and at a certain point in that process they make a decision and that decision may be yeah I don't want to go to that restaurant I'm I they don't have a vegetarian option or they might look at all of the details and go that's great this is the one I want to go with and at that point they move up the journey another rung and um, they move into what what's called conversion And at that point, that's really where um, a transaction takes place. Somebody gives you their credit card, somebody clicks the buy now button, somebody signs the contract. There are actually a couple of stages beyond that. And the next stage up is loyalty. And that's where we see repeat customers, repeat Mm. purchases, people who, you know, love what we do and keep coming back. And then there's one more step above that, and it's really the peak of this triangle, and it's the ultimate, it's the thing we're all kind of going for, and that's advocacy. And that's when somebody becomes an absolute raving fan. They love what we do. They tell all their friends about it. They refer people back to us. And um, that's really the buyer journey. And not everybody that comes into our field of awareness obviously makes it all the way to the top of that um, that pyramid. Hmm, thank you. And The thing for everyone to know is that the way that buyers move through the buyer's journey, they're still the same stages that people are going through, even though fundamentally the the way we purchase has changed. And what's changed is that we've become more self-directed as buyers. And what that means is that we're now equipped with more information as buyers than we ever have been before. And so when we, when someone does finally get to you, they may have been to other places before, because now we've got the internet, we've got search engines, we've got peer review sites, we've got social media and people making recommendations. We've got a 
bunch of content out there that we can use at the initial investigation stage. And I don't know about you, Michelle, but I'm just as likely to search Google as I am to ask my community on Facebook when I need a new, you know, resource. Oh, absolutely. And and it's not just Google now. There are so many great sort of specialist sites that give you, um, you know, peer review of, of, of a product. You can see ratings. You know, even if you want to buy a book right now and you go mm. to Amazon, you can see what a hundred other people that read that book think about it. And so that investigation is what your customers are doing. And that's really changed the ball game. So if they're searching for a product or service like yours, and you don't have a website, or you have an ineffective website, or your competitor is who they find, because your competitor has produced really valuable content that has them appear more valuable than you, then you're not part of that customer's conversation. And there's actually some research that backs this up. Um, It's a few years old now, but still very, very relevant. In 2010, uh, the average consumer consulted about five sources of information before making a purchase. That number doubled in just one year. So in 2011, they were actually consulting 11 sources of information before making a purchase. Now, that's them watching videos, customer reviews, as Michelle mentioned, they're getting information and awareness about your product. And if your content is not showing up in these results, chances are they're going about gathering information that they're going to used to make a buying decision and they're doing this without you. Now, Forrester Research, which is one of the most influential research and advisory firms in the world, um, did some studies that show that buyers might be anywhere from 60 to 90% of the way through their buying journey before they even make contact with you. And that's really important to understand. Yeah, I think that the the thing here, Susie, as you said, is if we're not inserting ourselves into that discussion or into that awareness phase or into that consideration phase now, the way our clients want to hear from us, then they're going ahead and making these decisions without us. So I want maybe another way to think about that would be to think of an example. So say, say uh, I sold boats and, you know, typically 10 years ago, Uh, If I sold boats, I might need to create a brochure, I might need to put out a Yellow Pages ad, maybe I'd advertise in the local paper or in some sort of recreational magazine. Uh, But really my clients had very few ways to gain information about if they were interested in buying a boat or even thinking about buying a boat um, or even dreaming about buying a boat. They had very few sources of information. So if they got to the point where they really wanted to find out more about buying a boat, they'd go to the Yellow Pages, they'd go to the boat and trade boat show, they'd go to um, into my trade into my showroom and ask for a brochure, ask for some sort of demonstration. They'd call and they'd speak to my salesperson. So really, really early on in that buyer journey, right at the beginning of that awareness phase, when they're just starting to educate themselves, they come onto my radar. Now if I'm doing a good job at that point, I'd take their, their details, I'd stay in touch with them, I'd give them follow-up calls, I might invite them back to come out on the water with me to take the boat for a test drive or whatever it was. But I knew about those people very, very early on and so I had the luxury really of not having to do too much else other than you know, stay in contact with them and do some of those more traditional sales or direct marketing kinds of activities. But now those very, very same people are not going to come onto my radar until they are well and truly into that consideration phase or possibly even on their way into the conversion phase. So that Forrester research says 60 to 90% of the way through that buyer journey. So that means how am I going to get on their radar earlier? And that's the magic of content marketing. That's how uh, I can do it. I can produce really great content about how to choose a, how to choose a boat or I can have a blog that's really respected and read. I can start tweeting about it. I can create a Facebook group, you know, boat lovers of the south coast of Australia or whatever it might be that gets me onto that radar early in the buyer's journey process because they're not looking at my Yellow Pages ad very much anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, if they haven't already asked for Yellow Pages to stop sending it. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, So what I really love about content marketing, um, Michelle, is that it's just so much fun. Um, Since we've been doing different types of content from, you know, the old direct marketing, since we've been harnessing all the great tools that are available there, we've discovered such 
really great ways to get in touch with our customers. And what I'm hoping for with this podcast is to really enable you and inspire you to have fun with this. Right. And and the difficulty of having fun with it is when you're slogging away, creating blog yeah. posts, creating really good content and nobody's really looking at it or they're looking at it and nobody's really moving from that point into that conversion phase or into, you know, wanting to take things further with you in terms of buying. And that's when it can get really demoralizing. So the fun side of it is when you produce great content that gets appreciated and that starts driving people into your business and, and, you know, wanting to buy from you. So I couldn't agree with you more. That's a great point. It's most fun when it works. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's a yes and for me. So, um, and, you know, I think that really gets me to thinking about who this podcast is for and, and, and it's for people like what we've just been saying, people who are potentially um, already doing a lot of content marketing and just finding they're not getting the traction that they would like. You know, maybe, maybe they're blogging or podcasting or creating great ebooks or courses and just not seeing that turn into sales. Or perhaps it's somebody who is just getting started with their content marketing journey and they're keen to embrace these new rules and to, you know, attract and keep their ideal clients and they want to, you know, start from the beginning in a way that's going to be really leveraged and that's going to be really intentional about that turning into sales. So it's really, you know, for anyone who's ultimately responsible for their marketing and their organisation and who doesn't want to be beating their head against the wall uh, with their content marketing, who really wants to take that content marketing and get the real magic and leverage that it's that it, that it has when you know how to do it well. Hmm. So if that sounds like you, then stay tuned. We have some really, really fun things in store, fun things that work. (laughs) Uh, As we launch into this podcast, I'm really excited about we're going to go together because for me, it is about attracting, converting and keeping your clients and using content to create automated marketing that works over and over again. I'm really big on creating something that you don't have to recreate consistently. And I think that's what ties up energy. That's what ties up resources. So we want to get really really clever at creating automated marketing systems that work over and over again. That's where we're headed and here's what you can expect. So in every episode, you're going to get lots of practical tips that you can implement. We're going to have lots of great information. We're going to have guests. We'll provide you with resources. So that could be, you know, links to other things to read or listen to, checklist downloads. We may even give you a little bit of homework now and then if you really want to go ahead Um, and get ahead and implement what you're learning and get feedback. And we're going to be, you know, right here on iTunes and Stitcher and wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. Um, But we'll always have a little more for you. Um, There'll be some more resources for you. And the first is the Content Sales Podcast Facebook group. Now you'll find it at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Content Sales Podcast. And that's where we're going to be interacting with you, answering questions and giving you a little more information. And that's going to be a really robust, lively community. You'll also find us at contentsellspodcast.com and this is a website where you'll find the show notes. So that means links to all the references we make here on the show, plus lots of great information. If we have a guest, then their details will be there so that you can make contact with them. So lots and lots of great resources. The website is also where you'll be able to get um to download some bonus resources like checklists and cheat sheets and we'll be creating different templates that you can use for your own content marketing. So I'll tell you a little more about all that um, in the next episode. Great. And that, and that seems like my cue to say what might be coming up in the next episode. What's coming up, Michelle? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm glad you asked, Susie. In the next episode, we're actually going to be sharing a framework that uh, we've created that helps you to understand the content marketing universe. Because what I've noticed is a lot of people see content marketing very one dimensionally. So they'll think, they'll, you know, they'll say, oh, I, I do content marketing, I've got a blog. Or it's about making regular posts on social media. But Seeing it so one-dimensionally is a bit like seeing just one planet in the universe and it's really a much bigger story than that. So to do it really well, you need to have a clear map of that entire universe and we'll be giving you a model, um, something that um, I call the content octagon and that will really help you to navigate this content marketing universe and focus on what's really important and what's going to get you the most traction and so we'll share that model with you in our very first episode. 
And that's coming up really, really soon. So uh, check for that. Um, if you want to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher, it means you'll get your new episodes uh, automatically and we'll be releasing new episodes every single week. So this is episode zero. I want to thank you for listening. I'm really looking forward to getting to know you better and to working with you to create really amazing content that sells. Michelle, anything you want to say before we sign off on episode zero? Um, a quick yippee for, the, for getting this up and running and I'm so excited to see where this journey is going to go and uh, I say, just going to part with my final words, which is kind of like my mantra, remember, no content without conversion. Great. Thanks, Michelle. You can find the show notes on our website at contentsellspodcast.com. Once again, thanks for listening. See you next time on the Content Sales Podcast.